Good morning. This was an unspeakable tragedy, but Alec Baldwin committed no crime. He was an actor acting, playing the role of Harlan Rust. An actor playing a character can act in ways that are lethal, that just aren't lethal on a movie set. These cardinal rules, they're not cardinal rules on a movie set. And I don't have to tell you much more about this because you've all seen gunfights in movies. And the reason that can happen is because safety is ensured before the actor. On this movie set, there were people responsible for ensuring the safety of the set and the firearm. Those people failed in their duties. But Alec Baldwin committed no crime. The most critical issue in this case is how a real bullet got on a movie set. The evidence will show that real bullets are never supposed to be on movie sets. Movie sets use dummies and blanks. Movie sets use dummies, fake inert bullets that look like real bullets, they don't go bang, for when you want a close-up of the gun. You can't tell them apart from live bullets by looking at them, which is why live bullets can be nowhere near a movie set. And if the director wants a shot of the gun going, you know, bang poof, there's blanks that they can use, and those blanks look nothing like real bullets, and they um, are used for those shooting scenes. And, you know, they'll play these videos that they described of Alex, you know, firearm in the movie going bang poof, you know, and people are conditioned to seeing people firing weapons and thinking that's a dangerous act, that's a dangerous act. And they will play those videos and give you that image to try to tarnish him in your eyes. But that's not what happened here. On this set, there was a real bullet, something that should never be on a movie set, something which has nothing to do with making a movie. And you will hear no evidence, not one word, that Alec Baldwin had anything to do with that real bullet being brought onto that set. The second critical issue in this case is why did a real bullet get loaded into a prop movie gun? It is undisputed that the bullet was loaded into the gun by the armorer, the person on set whose responsibility it was to ensure the gun was safe. And so picture that moment of the armorer placing a live bullet into that firearm. You know, you hear the prosecutor say, you know, he did this or he performed in a certain way. He picked out the biggest gun as his prop. It's to tarnish him in your eyes. You will hear no evidence whatsoever, no evidence that anything Mr. Baldwin did, that something he did in that moment, that horrible moment when she put that bullet in that gun, none of it had anything to do with Alec Baldwin. And finally, the first assistant director's job, the head of safety, Dave Halls, checks it before it goes to the actor. And he will tell you he made a tragic mistake. He failed to detect a live bullet. And Alec Baldwin had nothing to do with that either. So all this evidence that the prosecutor just outlined, all of it, has nothing to do with these critical issues. Nothing. Which leads us to this. The evidence will show that on a movie set, Safety has to occur before the gun is placed in the actor's hands. In this case, this unique case on a movie set, the prop gun was placed in Mr. Baldwin's hands and cold gun was announced, meaning it had been checked and double-checked by those responsible to ensure the gun was safe. It was just a prop. They all thought it was just a prop and could do no harm. The actor's job is to act, to rehearse, to choreograph his moves, to memorize his lines. He's Harlan Rust. He's an outlaw running for his life, who in the incident in question, he's pulling a six-shooter to try to defend himself. That's why the gun has to be safe before it gets into the actor's hands. His mind is somewhere else, in the being of another, a century away, an outlaw. He must be able to take that weapon and use it as the person he's acting would, to wave it, to point it, to pull the trigger like actors do in ways that would be lethal in the real world, but are not lethal on a movie set. And I'm going to show you that scene now before lunch. And if we could just play action. I'm going to go find some help. I don't need no damn help. You're going to die if you don't. He's wounded on the run. You can play again. Continue. Arlen 
rust. You just stand up nice and slow. Toss any weapons you have. He's on the church pew, bleeding, his hand gripping the revolver. He would defend himself against the men in the movie. Play. One more. You good? Ready? Arlen Rust. Did you get up nice and slow, tossing the weapons you have? <clears throat> Stand right here for you. So, so whip it out. Yeah. Okay, well, let me get this little grease ready. Okay, ready? Okay, ready? Ready. And set. Ready and action. Island Russ. No danger. They want him to do it again. And set, ready, and action. Arlen Rust. It's a scene similar to scenes we've all seen in movies and television, performed by thousands of actors. And the scene that continues after lunch is the same scene, it's just not unfortunately captured on videotape. And the scene they envisioned and acted out, that prop gun was positioned in the afternoon so close to the camera that you could see inside, that you could feel it. You could feel that it was loaded, and it was loaded, of course, with dummies. Dummies to make it look like a real gun. But this one time, one of those dummies was a real bullet. The real bullet was not known to anyone in that church. Amongst the actors, directors, and crew in the scene, everyone was doing exactly how they go about their business every day on a movie, not as if some lethal element had been included in the environment. You will see creativity and movement and everyone talking and vibrant. No one had any idea that this venomous, toxic element had been inserted into this magic they were creating. But it did. It entered that place. It killed an amazing person. It wounded another. And it changed lives forever. And so to find out what happened on that movie set, you, knew, you need to do something that the prosecutors could never do. You have to step back and remember what they were doing on a movie set. What were Helena Hutchins, the cinematographer, Joel Souza, the director, and Alec Baldwin, the actor, doing on Bonanza Creek Ranch. You know, movies and magic have always been closely associated. The first people that made movies were magicians. And this imagination that happens in movies, you know, King Kong, he can stand above a city, and Superman can fly, horses and snakes, and gun battles. For this to all work, for cinematography, what Helena did to work, for acting to work, you have to be so close to the barrier of real and imagined that the viewer feels that they're there, that it's real. The viewer can't see strings from the stuntman. The stuntman must leap. The snake must hiss. And guns happen in movies all over this country for many decades. Bang, bang. You've all seen it. Guns have been an element of theater and film and television since the earliest of times. Depictions of war and combat, Spartacus, it stirs audiences because it feels real. Later films, Platoon, Apocalypse Now, they showed the unvarnished realities of war. This ranch in Santa Fe, it had been the scene to many gunfights and movie scenes, well before Alec was even born. Laramie, Butch and the Sundance Kid, and these westerns...
the evidence will show that guns are in movies because movies are about people's lives and guns are in people's lives. So let's talk about the evidence and how the lethal bullet got there. How did this happen and how did it unfold? The evidence will be the following. Everybody on a movie set has a role. The armor or armors, the director directs, the actor acts. They work in harmony, but they have a division of responsibility. Safety being important has the first assistant director, whose name is Dave Halls, above the, the, the armor and the, sort of the safety of the set. And on that day in question, the cast and the creative directors and crew in the church, it's a, it's a fake church, their actors are not in their normal clothes, it's costumes, there's debris falling from the ceiling, it's fake debris, and they yell out cold gut. And that is an important term you're going to learn in this case. It means that the gun is cold. No one need worry. But even that requires a little bit more explanation. Cold gun doesn't mean no live bullets. There are for sure 100% no live bullets on movie sets. That's unimaginable. Cold means you don't even have the fake, fake blank poof um, dump, uh, uh, in it. You don't need to worry even about you know, eye gear or, 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 or um, earplugs for, for that fake bang. It means it's empty, inert, cosmetic, can do no harm. Cold guns can't hurt people. It's impossible, literally impossible for a cold gun to hurt somebody. You, you, you could hurt you more by dropping it on your foot. And that's why these artists are carrying on in their art. Cold gun, gun all clear to go. And the armorer on this set hands a prop gun to Alec, like she had done times before, like people have done with him in movies for a generation. And he's there. He's in the movie set church with his movie set gear and his holster, and he takes his movie set gun. And he's deeply focused in that moment on his character. The artists, the crew members, they're, they're moving around him. Again, no, no eye, eye gear or earplugs, nothing to protect against. They carry on. They practice. They rehearse. They take a lunch break. Some folks leave, some don't. They continue the scene. Dave Halls, the head of safety, is actually practicing the movement so they can frame. They can frame the, the footage that will happen after lunch. And the prop cold gun comes back. The prop cold gun comes back. Cold gun. They call it again. Same gun, again, safe. The first assistant director, Dave Halls, head of safety for the entire film, a man with decades of experience, comes and takes the additional step and inspects the gun, verifies again, cold gun. Everyone relax. Go back to focus on the making of a movie. There's nothing in the gun that can hurt anybody. And Alex sits on that pew. And they, the creative directors, the crew, they're moving around him, in front of him. And Harlan Rust, he begins, like the prosecutor told you, rehearsing, acting. This is a completely mundane, uneventful, routine act on a movie set. On a movie set. And so everybody carries on. Nobody fathomed, imagined, foresaw any possible danger. They moved around Alec as he practiced his draw. As the prosecutor put it, working out the details of the move and the actor. He does it, does it again, does it in a different way. Nobody bats an eye. And they will tell you that the investigation revealed that Baldwin was practicing drawing and pointing the weapon of the scene with guidance and instruction from Helena Hutchins and Joel Souza. The gun goes off. Everybody's shocked. Alec is startled. He, 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 all, he immediately says, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, I didn't mean to shoot the gun. I, I didn't pull the trigger. Immediately. What the hell just happened? They collectively explain. Shock turns to panic. 911 is called. Bonanza Creek Ranch right now. We've got two people shot on a movie set accidentally. He said someone was shot? Two people accidentally. Okay. Gun, gunshots at on movie set. Bonanza Creek Ranch. Send it. Send it. I'll connect you with medical dispatcher. Don't need that. Sanitary Fire and EMS wants to location of emergency? No, uh, Bonanza Creek Ranch has had two people accidentally shot on a movie set by a prop gun. We need help immediately. Okay. This fucking AD that yelled at me at lunch because asking about revisions. This motherfucker, did you see him lean over my desk and yell at me? He 
Ex Accidentally shot on a movie set with a prop gun. The fucking AD, it was his responsibility. Not a word about Alec Baldwin. While they're en route, police, EMS, the cast and crew are outside trying to figure out what happened, frantic, talking to those responsible for the prop and its safety. The armorer is yelling, sorry. Hall's the first assistant director is panicked. The prop master, Sarah Zachary, I, I don't know exactly where she is at, at, at that point, but they check the gun fervishly. They take the ammo out of the gun. They look at it, what the heck happened. They go back to the prop cart that houses the ammo. They're touching the gun and manipulating the gun, emptying it. They go and move some stuff off the prop cart, trying to figure it out. Sarah Zachary, the head of props, will tell you she threw some stuff out. And, and eventually, of course, EMS and police arrive pretty soon thereafter. And Helena Hutchins and Joel Souza, the director, are transported to the hospital where Helena tragically passes away. And, and I'm not going to be asking questions about her condition after she was wounded or the medical interventions that followed. Her injuries, the efforts to revive her, are not in dispute in this case. Um, the evidence will, will be there. The prosecutor may present some of these emotionally charged images, um, but we're not going to be asking questions about that, and it's not an issue in dispute in this case. Um, and and uh, you jurors are allowed to ask yourselves whether or not that should be the focus or the focus should be the evidence. So police enter the scene. They have lapel cameras. Thank God they have lapel cameras. You want to see what happens? The evidence will show you can play the videotape. Want to see if they take the right gun? Play the videotape. Want to make sure what the people said or did they're remembering correctly? Play the videotape. And so they immediately recover the prop gun and they secure it. That's off to the side. And, and the reason that you preserve things in the moment is so that you know what existed in the moment, the evidence in the moment, the people and the witnesses and what they said in the moment. These folks, the members of Rust, they'd never been through anything like this before. That is why what they originally said matters so much in this case. If you remember anything I say today as the evidence proceeds, remember that. Look at the evidence of what the people of Rust said and did that day. Life changes, memories change, there are human motivations, internal pressure, external pressure. That's why preservation is so important. So the police continue. In terms of the prop cart and the prop ammo that's on the cart, it's manipulated, altered, kind of messy. Um, and you know, at this accidental shooting on a movie set, the police begin to make some mistakes. No one had ever <coughs> investigated a prop gun on a movie set before. They recover the prop gun, but they don't wear gloves. They don't have the prop car inside the crime scene. Someone moves it onto the crime scene. People start touching it and showing, okay, this is a dummy, this is a blank. And then they make another mistake that, that matters in this case um, um, with some more significance, which is that they don't secure the prop truck that houses the cart. See, that cart that they roll off comes from a truck where all of the ammunition, all of the firearms are, and that's where they're stored. They don't secure the prop truck for several days. Um, and then the prop house that supplies the truck, that supplies the cart, they don't secure for over a month. A lot of mistakes. They had never investigated a case in a movie set. But they had the prop gun. That was key. Um, and so they needed to figure out where the live bullet came from. They had the shell casing, Starline Brass. That's the, that's the sort of make. You'll hear that phrase, Starline Brass. And the police were right to focus on that. That was the lethal element. And so they work outward, makes good enough sense. Folks around the ammo and the gun to be interviewed at the precinct. The armorer at the precinct, she loaded the live bullet. Hall's head of safety, he double checked. And Alec walks up to the police, you'll see this early today, and he says, I'm here, whatever you want to do, whatever you need me to do, just tell me where to go. And uh, Sarah Zachary, the prop master who threw out the stuff at the cart, they, they missed her that night um, to bring to the precinct. But the rest of them at the precinct, and thankfully, we have the lapel cameras. And then we cleared, they cleared the gun outside after uh, his request, and I witnessed them clear it and saw the bullets. Okay. So, so everyone was, yes. they were all high. 
the one that was sure yesterday, the one that fired, we don't know, but all the other ones were proper. I can turn, I can pause this. I can turn this off. Move on. The, that was just a, a quick snapshot of the scene. Let, let, let's approach, uh, with the, this is, Ms. Johnson. They consented to the exhibit. on the scene. They're interviewed with lapel cameras. They're interviewed by the lead detective, Detective Cano. And those witnesses, some of them will come in here and testify. And not a single one of them will tell you anything different than what I'm about to tell you about the evidence. The gun was double checked, verified it was a cold gun, not an actor's responsibility to check. Safety was ensured before. Alec was doing his practicing, his rehearsing, his movements. People manipulate and point guns on movie sets. The gun went off during the rehearsal. No one saw him intentionally pull the trigger. It was obviously a tragic accident, but Alec committed no homicide. Alec took the gun from those charged with its safety. He did not tamper with it. He did not load it himself. He did not leave it unattended. It completed his costume and his character. It was an actor handling a prop and integrating it into the character of Harlan Rust. There was a dedicated professional there, off camera, whose sole sacred responsibility was that prop safety. And Dave Halls, the head of safety, was there by her side. Everyone relied on that. And it was tragic that they let them down. He was just acting as he has done for generations. And it was the safety apparatus that failed them all. So law enforcement continues. They need to find the live bullet. That was the lethal element. So they, led by Detective Cano, execute a search warrant on the church. And that's what law enforcement does. They immediately go to a judge. They say, this is what we need to do. They go into the church urgently before anything can be altered. They're confirming it was an accident, not a crime in the church. They search for guns and ammunition, videos and photos. There was no further answer in the church. They had the prop gun. They had all those witnesses secured, their statements are clear. Alec had committed no crime, but the bullet was a mystery. And so they focus on the bullet, the critical lethal bullet, and how did it enter the movie set? So they had the prop cart, and then they go do the warrant on the prop truck. And so at that point, and I'm going to put up a photo so that you can see some of these individuals are, um, they're trying to figure out when they go to the truck, where is, what is the source of the lethal, lethal bullet? And so they execute a warrant on the truck approximately a week later. The Seth Kenny that you heard about in the prosecutor's opening, the supplier for the set, he's there. Sarah Zachary, the prop master, she's there. And they walk through what's inside of the prop truck with law enforcement. But there's no answer to the lethal bullet. And you know, the, 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 this case then takes on, you know, uh, uh, all this pressure, you know, the media begins swirling. Where is the lethal bullet? How did it got, get on that movie set? And what about that actor, Alec Baldwin, who had nothing to do with why the bullet got on the movie set? And so police and prosecutors, they work hand in hand, meeting after meeting, trying to find the lethal bullet, meeting with Seth Kenny, meeting with Sarah Zachary, the prop master, the supplier. Where is it? And about a month after the incident, Sarah Zachary finally sits down with law enforcement to answer some questions. And um, she explains to them that she, she threw away some stuff. She, she disposed of some stuff. Um, and they, the prosecutors and police keep meeting, swirling media, and then at that point, they go to the last step, right? We've done the cart, we've gone to the truck, we met with Sarah Zachary, and they go execute a search warrant on, as the prosecutor told you, PDQ, the prop house. And again, Seth Kenny's there to greet them, let them in, and they don't find the lethal bullet. They never did. They never did. And as things roll in to police and prosecutors, cell phones and photos and forensics, looking for this shiny object, they found another shiny object. Instead of trying to find the source of the lethal bullet, 
They focused on Mr. Baldwin. But Mr. Baldwin was like every other actor. He goes bang bang in movies. He's told when guns are cold or not. He rehearses and acts as his character. Safety proceeds before the actor. Once the actor has the prop gun, he can handle it however a person he's acting as would. A properly cleared gun can't hurt anybody. And so they told you about some of the things that Alex said in the statements that they will, they will take or, or pick out a few lines from. But he won't tell you anything different, that he, that he took a gun loaded and cleared by the armor and the AD. He made motions with the gun as he was rehearsing. He didn't intentionally pull the trigger. The gun just went off. And he does say, I didn't have a problem with the gun before. And this idea, you know, that they said that he, that he, would have, he didn't want to check because he would offend them, you know, in this moment, he, he's been doing this for 40 years, the evidence will show. And he has habits, and there are also SAG guidelines that tell actors what to do and what not to do. And the SAG guidelines don't tell actors to check the gun. You will see them. That's not the actor's role. And so I guess the point that they're trying to make is that why in this specific moment he doesn't break his habit of 40 years and, and check it differently and sort of insult them this one time. You know, if he had done that and started playing with the gun in that way, they'd be saying, arrogant actor, why is he doing that? So they will play these statements, Alex statements. You're going to hear a man in shock and grief, a father, a, a, an artist, worried about his family. You hear he's, you know, a, a, on one of the calls, he's, he's going to meet with the decedent's family, the Hutchins family, and he's upset about that. He will talk to law enforcement. He will call them. He doesn't need a lawyer. He didn't commit a crime. He will call them and offer to meet and speak over and over again. And ask anyone in the acting world. Actors know. Actors rely on armors and point guns and shoot guns. The armorers act. What they did is clear and proven. The head of safety, you will learn, took responsibility for his verification failure. But Alec committed no homicide. So law enforcement didn't have a homicide case against Alec Baldwin, but they changed the question. You heard the prosecutor tell you about this, did he pull the trigger? Did he pull the trigger? Did he intentionally pull the trigger? And if, if he did, of course, that would only make his statement incorrect, right? That would mean he would have misspoke, been incorrect. You know, and I want to stop for a moment and just tell you, because you're going to hear a lot of testimony expert testimony that the prosecutor told you about the gun functioning imperfectly. Did he let the hammer down when he cocked it? Did he hit the trigger? Did he in a calculated manner as the prosecutor met, um, made a motion, you know, fire the gun like that? And when this issue is discussed, it's easy to sort of pull yourself into courtroom land and away from a movie set. On a movie set, you're allowed to pull the trigger. So even if even if he intentionally pulled the trigger like the prosecutor just demonstrated, that doesn't make him guilty of homicide. He did not know or have any reason to know that gun was loaded with a live bullet. That's the key. That live bullet is the key. That is the lethal element. But again, as the prosecutor told you, they, if they could prove that he intentionally pulled the trigger and he was imperfect, imprecise, wrong with what he said, then maybe you take that and you say he's lying. And if he's a liar, he committed homicide. And so what they do is they take the prop gun. They're blinded by the shine. They're blinded by trying to disprove Alec. They take it and they order a destructive test on the firearm. They order the FBI to take a test that they know will destroy the firearm. It's a pointless, unnecessary test where they blindly try to make this big case by taking a mallet and smashing the firearm. At the time that they did that, they knew that Alec had, had maintained, adamantly maintained, that he was manipulating the hammer and the gun just went off. That the witnesses said it went off out of nowhere. That there are these accidental discharges that happen on the set. That guns have issues in the real world. That this gun had a hair trigger. And the owner's manual of this specific gun actually says that if you load it with a live round or any round in the chamber, in, in that last position, and you drop it like you see a cowboy in a movie, this type of old cowboy gun can accidentally go off. I don't remember hearing anything about that. The evidence will show that. So rather than trying to answer the question of what happened, they proceed with the destructive test. They eliminate the one eye, 
<clears throat> the one item that could prove what Alex said and believed. They didn't offer him a chance to test the gun. They didn't take the gun apart before they broke it and destroyed it and look at its inner workings. They didn't turn on their videotape. They just destroyed it. Can't ever be tested in the same condition it was in that day. Won't ever allow Alec to show his truth. And the destruction of this gun that you will hear in this evidence is symbolic of this entire case. Because the officers will tell you at that point, they weren't really investigating anymore. They were trying to disprove Alec, to get Alec, to have this day. And so after the destruction of the firearm, they hired some expert witnesses you heard about to, to pick up the pieces, so to speak. And the state retained Lucian Haig, an expert with over half a century of experience. And he will come into court and he will tell you he's never seen anything like this in his entire career. They conducted a pointless test, a test that would lead to inevitable destruction of the firearm. There were other correct tests that they could have done to prove whether or not it could have accidentally discharged. None of the experts can test the gun in the condition it was in on the day in question. Why? Not because of something that Alec Baldwin or the crew members of Russ did. They were all clear. The gun just went off. But because of something that law enforcement did. And they deprived him of that opportunity. However, Lucian Haig will tell you that in his analysis, he did find modification that he thought likely pre-existed the FBI testing. And what that modification means and, and how it impacted the gun is hard to perfectly know, of course. But it, it was a modification on an important part, the critical part of the firearm. And it was important enough for them to put into a report and to write a new opinion about. They felt this revelation had to be sent to prosecutors. And they maintained that position, that this modification was a matter of import for almost a year. And then a few weeks ago, before trial, they just took it back. They just took it back. You will get to see the circumstances of that take back. How far they would go for the shiny object. They never solved the question of the lethal bullet. They destroyed the gun, and all they were left with is Alec Baldwin and the movie they intend to put on. But because they never solved the lethal bullet, they eliminated the prop gun, there will not be one witness, not one shred of evidence in this trial, that Alec knew or should have known the gun was loaded with a live round. So they can't prove. They can't prove their high-profile homicide case. So they, they will proceed to then, here and now, tell you about other things, other evidence that you will hear that has nothing to do with what happened in the church on October 21st. That the movie said as a, as a whole was improper or anything. That, he, that they hired the wrong armorer, I think I heard in, in opening. The, the, the evidence will show that the armorer was hired by somebody else, trained by somebody else, had done gun scenes on Rust with somebody else before Alec even got there. She was the daughter and the apprentice of the most famous and well-respected armorer in Hollywood. And she had just loved, left serving, being an armorer for Nicolas Cage on another Western. Then they'll come in and they'll say, but what about the movie guidelines? You heard about Mr. Jorgensen and the movie guidelines. That, that one of the protocols wasn't followed. Or there was a set safety issue about, about something unrelated to this. Like these movie guidelines on, on, on a set or the things of Navy SEALs and NASA. The guidelines were followed. They followed the safety guidelines. Actors don't check the weapons. Safety is ensured by dedicated personnel. So they will say, you know, but there had been accidental discharges on the set that guns had fired accidentally prior. Not related to Alec, by the way. You know, but again, that's the people we looked at. Hannah Gutierrez-Reed's fault, Sarah Zachary's fault perhaps, Dave Hall's fault, faults, workplace issues, some of them will end up, and you will hear the witnesses in this case, many of them have brought civil lawsuits. You know, and you'll hear that you know, in those civil lawsuits, they're presenting evidence to try to meet a burden, not a, not a criminal, beyond a reasonable doubt, homicide trial burden, but they're going to try to prove their cases in civil courts. And that's where faults and accidents are, at worst, 99% worked out. Not here. But you'll hear these members of the Russ crew come in here. 
They'll try to make sense of this for you. Some of them have sued. Some of them are in grief. Some of them are in grief and have sued. And part of this grief they feel that everybody feels is understandable. And what they will do is they will tell you, you know, if, if only we had had a second armorer. One of them will say, if only Dave Halls had checked better. If only the camera hadn't been right there and Ms. Hutchins wasn't leaning over the camera. If only I myself did this. If only Alec did that. This is natural, their testimony. It's part of the human condition. It's part of grief. Objection, Your Honor. None of them knew. As I was saying, the witnesses in their grief will look for reasons to try to make sense of this tragedy. But again, none of them knew or should have known about the lethal bullet either. No one had any idea that it was on that set or in that gun. In that world, they were all in it together. And you will hear that none of this other stuff has anything to do with those two critical questions we started with. Why there was a live bullet on set? why the armor replaced it in the gun, and of course, why the head of safety failed to detect it. None of it speaks to whether Alec knew or should have known those things. He didn't. No one on that set did. It was not foreseeable. You will hear that word from the witnesses and from, the, and from eventually the instructions. Foreseeable. This was anything other than foreseeable. And they must prove beyond any and all reasonable doubt that this was foreseeable total indifference to human life that death might occur. He's an actor. He's an actor. But here we are at a homicide trial. And so they will pull and they will pull witnesses and, and witnesses will be cross-examined. They will push themselves to the edge of truth and beyond. You know, these things about, you know, Alec didn't notice this or Alec didn't notice that. I want to make sure that you're clear on something that the evidence will show. He had been filming on that set for a handful of days. The evidence will show he had just gotten there. It's not as if he had been there for months and months and noticed things and failed things. And he had just gotten there. You don't notice every little thing when you start at a new place and when you're in the character of Harlot Rust. But they will push forward and they will have gaps in the evidence as well. Don't expect you to be hearing and for them to call the first AD head of safety. I don't know if you'll be hearing from the lead detective, Canal, who investigated this case, the lead detective, or the sergeant that supervised him, Sergeant Zook. I don't think you'll hear from Mr. Schilling, who was the lead investigator for the prosecutors. And so as you hear this, the ju you jurors can, can assess about that gap of evidence. And there's one thing that I can tell you you will not hear also. You will not hear from an actor or an expert in acting. And so they will play the videotapes of Alec Baldwin, the actor, acting. They will show you perhaps over and over again him in shooting scenes. Bad Alec. Bad Alec shooting a gun the wrong way in a movie scene. They will try to get you to picture that and forget that this was a movie set in the first place. And you will see actors in a Western acting. And your mind might go to your favorite gun scene in your favorite movie. You may picture actors and actresses doing exactly what you see here. The other actors in Rust are doing the same thing that Mr. Baldwin was doing. But when you come back from that moment, remember, this is a homicide trial. And you will, see, you will see soon that the reason they play those videos of him over and over is because they don't have any ev evidence of actual homicide. And you will learn the truth. Not a day goes by when we don't wish Alec had saved her life. But never, the witnesses will tell you, in the history is something that an actor has done, intercepted a live bullet from a prop gun. No actor in, in history. No one could have imagined or expected an actor to do that. So just remember that truth. So when they cry out justice, justice is truth. This was an unspeakable tragedy. Alec Baldwin committed no crime. Thank you. All right, thank you.
you. What we're going to do now is we're going to take our um, morning um, bathroom break. So please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Um, and um, follow what Mr. Bing tells you to do. And um, what we'll see you back here about 20th. All right. Thank you. All rise to the jury.